I see a bobcat, I just want a between a six and eight inch loop. One thing about cats is you gotta target your cat by the track. The cats range, they vary. They can go from 15 pounds to 50 pounds. There's, I, uh, I've caught quite a few cats that are 49, 50 pounds. I've caught quite a few that are 15. That makes a size difference. That makes a head difference. So they're going, you just say, wow, that's a huge track. It's big as a, like a snuff can. That's a huge track. Well, if that's a big cat, I'm just going to slide my ferrule, put it up, and get a bigger loop. But I still want to hang at about four inches off the bottom. The cats usually walk with their heads straight, and they, they're short-legged. Now, if it's a coyote, coyotes you usually do 10 and 10. You get a 10-inch loop, 10 inches off the ground, and that usually nails coyotes. They're pretty, you know, that's what I do. Now, for fox, you split the 10s. You go 6 and 4. So I want to do a 6-inch loop 4 inches off the ground. So that's what you got to do is you got to pick out your animal and target for the height and the width of your snare. Now, here's one thing I want to emphasize is, now this snare, say I'm going to set it for a bobcat. So what I'm going to do is tighten up my loop. And another thing you want to check is, and it does happen is, if there's like heavy freezing rain, this cam lock, it will lock up. It'll freeze up. So if you hold this and it falls right down, that's what I want. Always check your cam before you set it. Or if you go out checking your snares and say, wow, you know, it rained a couple days ago. It froze in this snare. I just haven't got nothing in it yet. Maybe that cam froze up. So that's one thing you got to do. So say like I'm going after a real nice big cat. I'm going to put this here, I'm going to wrap this around, I like to get a double, couple double wraps, but I want it tight against this tree, I want it tight, so then I can just loop it under like this, and I go under, and this is, and if you keep it about a half inch away from that end here, this will hold your wire up too. So right there, that's perfect for cat. But okay, now I have an opening. And a lot of people, well, you do, you, they'll still go through it. No, I like to direct my cat. I want his head to go right through here. Perfect. I don't want no hitting off to the side or going around. So what I do is, this is what the rebar is for. You're dealing with frozen ground in Minnesota. So what I'll do is I'll take this rebar, run it through, work it, Pull it out. Grab a stick. Stick it right in that hole. And it stays there. Now, your cat's targeted to right here. He he can't go on the side. He can't go over on this side. I, I, I like to keep my brush like that. Now, here's another thing is, okay, I got a little opening here. What I want... I'm going to run another one. Work it around. I'll pull the reel bar. Grab another stick. Shove it in, and it's going to stay. Now, the reason I'm doing this is this, he's, this is tight. And what I want is I want approximately one inch from the cable to the stick on each side. And he's going to direct. He's going to see the biggest opening is right in the center. And he's going to hit it. And this cam lock's going to roll up over and get him. It's going to hit his chest. This is going to hit his chest. And he's done. And that's what I emphasize is you got to keep it tight. This Now, if I took these sticks out and kept it open, there's more of a chance for him to go on the outside or either side. I want him to hit direct, just perfectly direct. Then, as you can see, I used a real nice green popple. Then I'm a wire up here. 
So when it chokes them out, he's going to wrap around and he's going to take all this brush and he's just going to wrap up and it's going to tighten them up and he's going to choke right out as far as a cat. So, and like I said, the size, the coyotes, uh, you, tar you go for your targeted animal. Okay, I was checking my coyote sets this morning and check my snares and you can see the coyote trail. And got a nice coyote here. He wrapped up into the snare. Does a pretty good job. Once you get him there, pretty much done. And you can see that he, he wrapped up pretty good. And that's usually what happens is when they come, they just hook and they're done. They're pretty much done. The gray fox in a nice set. So you come through. You come down the trail. So, nice snare. This one here, you got them. But grays, they usually don't choke out, which is kind of surprising. This is just a young gray. You see these two grays, they were running kind of side by side. I got one about 30 feet away. And now I got this one. So you can see they wrap up, they're pretty much done. So it was a good day, double set. All right, I'm here. Uh, uh, this is Dale, and uh, we're actually snaring on his property. We got this coyote here. And I thought this might be a good time to talk a little bit about uh, what to look for as far as habitat. You know, if you find an old growth forest, that has a very little ground cover there isn't going to be much food in there. there's not going to be many rabbits and so forth so it's not that good uh, so right after the forest is logged then a lot of times you'll have pretty good trapping and snaring for quite a while because there's a lot of food there and there's a lot of reason for the animals to be there dale now uh, this was logged off uh, uh, about 10 years ago about 10 years ago so you, what you see now there's a few trees left but it's mostly these popples that are you know six to ten years old and uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of good uh, uh, good reasons for the animals to be in here coyotes fox bobcats all of them are in here and matter of fact there's a set of gray fox tracks right over here but uh, so that's a good example and uh, as you can see uh, this this coyotes all he's all wrapped up here and uh, you know he was tied off up high and uh, he didn't do a lot of damage here but he's uh, uh, he's ready to be skinned so uh, I think we can reset this trail right here behind us, and uh, we'll be off to the next mm -hmm. set. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate the opportunity. To, uh, yeah, you, you've welcome. been a big help to both me and Rick over the years, so I, we're grateful to have uh, your friendship. The key to finding bobcat, fox, and coyotes is determining where they spend the most time. That's how we can figure out where we have the best odds of catching them. As forests age, they go through periods where they are either good or bad places for the predators to hunt. It makes the most sense to spend as much time as possible in these areas where they are spending their hunting time. Most of the northern forest area where we snare is logged periodically. After an area is clear cut, new vegetation grows rapidly. Sunlight can get to the ground and plants grow thick and green which attracts the animals that the predators want to eat. Rabbits and hares, mice and voles, grouse and other small mammals are abundant in these new forest areas with the thick cover. While the animals hunt in here, the first couple years after logging it can be difficult to snare. Because number one, it's so thick, and number two, the plants are small and it's difficult to find something to tie off to in the right place. As this new growth starts to mature, it gets really good for quite a few years. There are a lot of small mammals living in it. There are good trails, the predators are using it a lot. They hunt in here every day and there are plenty of good places to snare and tie off our snares to. As the maturing continues, trees get bigger and the canopy of leaves begin to block out the sunlight. When this happens, the amount of undergrowth decreases and along with it there are fewer predators because there is less food for them to eat. In a fully mature forest, predators can see a long distance and the prey isn't using it very much. While predators feel safe traveling through these areas, they're usually on the move when they go through them and they're not really hunting. If you see a set of tracks or a trail in an open area in the forest, it usually means that predator was between two hunting areas. It's going from something to somewhere. They, there still can be some opportunities to snare in these areas, but it's more difficult to find trails because there's little cover and it's more difficult to tie off your snares. 
often you're left with nothing but larger trees and not much undergrowth. Because of all this, it's best to concentrate your scouting and your snaring in areas where the cover is plentiful. That generally means clear cuts that are 12 to 15 years old. Brand new clear cuts can be pretty good, but we tend to snare around the edges of them where they are entering and exiting. It's not a bad idea to just walk around the clear cut and try to find these trails. A co the quality of an area for snaring predators can also have a lot to do with what types of trees are planted and when they're planted. A lot of clear cuts are planted immediately with pine and spruce trees. These tiny deciduous trees are a small part of the growth in the early stages, but as they get bigger they tend to shade out the other growth. Some of the best areas for hunting, particularly for the bobcats, can be found when these trees are about the size of Christmas trees up to 12 to 14 foot tall. At that time you have a really nice combination of deciduous and coniferous trees that really attract bobcats because the rabbits just love it in there. All right, I took this cherry red. Uh, it's getting late toward the season. Took this cherry red, he was coming across and he was going up through here and actually there's a field back there that we didn't know it and Bernie's going to go on about how we found out this field and this cherry red is going up in there feeding off mice, voles, you know, whatnot. So uh, just a little bit more about using Google Earth. Uh, or you know any kind of online maps, you know you can you can get online and look at these aerial photographs, and you can find fields and field edges. You can find beaver dams that the bobcats are going to cross, and and there's just a lot of things you can find. You know old logging roads, so you can find access to get back into places and so forth. And a lot of times, uh, you know, if you really learn how to uh, determine how the animals are moving along these areas, like this field edge. Um, you know, a lot of the animals, they, they like edges, they like to run specific things and, and uh, then you just have to work those edges and find the trails where they're leading in and out of uh, the fields and so forth. Uh, you know, one, one thing that fox and coyotes and bobcats all, they, uh, they like uh, uh, marshes and swamps and, and any, anywhere that will have uh, a lot of mice and stuff like that and sometimes the fallow fields or CRP are good examples of that. But um, anyway, let's... Uh, Let's get this one out of here, Rick. Yep. Aerial photos such as those available on Google Earth and Bing Maps have become a remarkable resource. In addition to seeing our trapping area from satellite imagery, there are websites that show GIS, property lines, and even have contacts for the property owners. We can now look at a piece of property from an eagle's eye view, determine the potential for setting snares and traps, and then look at the property lines. We can determine if it's public property or not and find the owners of the property with their contact information on these county GIS sites. Never before has there been such a useful scouting resource. When analyzing these properties from the air, we look for several things such as access points, funnels, and habitat influences. Access points can be logging roads, snowmobile trails, ATV accessible trails, or even in some cases, rivers. Funnels are land features that cause predators to travel in a certain direction. These can be the edges of large open fields, steep bluffs, busy roadways, lakes, rivers, or any long running barriers that cause the animals to follow them rather than cross them. These features concentrate travel and are good places to look for trails. Habitat influences can be small things such as the edges of ponds and small lakes. With the aerial photo you can see if the pond has steep banks or is surrounded by cattails that might attract predators. Does the pond have a beaver lodge in it? Is the creek dammed up to where it might be a good crossing going over the beaver dam? There are excellent places for trails to develop around beaver dams. Logging cuts are also habitat influences. Willow swamps also offer excellent hunting for the bobcats and they know where they are. Find the features that would focus the attention of the predators, then look for anything that would connect these features and you have a good chance of finding a trail along it. Keep in mind that these aerial photos do not depict topography very well. Ridges and low ground can also inclu influence travel patterns. The old saying, think high and think low, often holds true. Once you find a good looking area on your computer screen, you must get out there and burn the boot leather to actually learn it. Okay, this is what I look for is once you get to a pond, I kind of stay, I don't want to mark up the pond because what happens is cats, when they come down on these hills, they'll stop at the top of the hill and they'll overlook before they come out to a pond. Make sure it's clear of danger or anything like that. And if you start marking up your ponds and walking all over, they, they, they know that. Cats don't like interaction with humans. 
And so I stay real close to the ponds and I look for the entrance point and the exit point for cats. They always make one, they'll go in at a certain point and go out a certain point and that's what you look for. And they always check out beaver houses. The reason that they, you know, as far as beaver houses, like in the summertime there was always baby ducks on here, wood ducks, uh, that's, so they're always accustomed to beaver houses and beaver ponds. So that's where you look for cat tracks is usually around beaver ponds and that don't mean that they hunt or anything in the wintertime but they're always attracted to them. When there isn't much snow, predators will access ponds and marshes almost anywhere. But they do tend to take the path of least resistance which means that they will use beaver trails and easy access points like where the banks aren't very steep. But once the snow gets deeper and deeper, all predators tend to have one primary access point where they get on a pond and one point where they tend to leave the pond. The animals enter the pond, they cruise around the edges, and maybe check out the beaver lodge and any other interesting features, then, then they leave the pond on the same general trail as the other animals each time. They then cross through the forest to another pond or marsh or a thicket wherever they tend to be hunting at the time. These animals tend to have regular circuits that they run and that's why these trails can be very good. Occasionally you'll follow tracks and discover that an animal entered the pond, trotted around the edges hunting as he went and then exited the pond by the same trail he come in on. While this does happen it doesn't seem to be as common as a pond having an entry and an exit point. These animals are traveling through an area hitting the ponds as they go. Obviously once you figure out where these entry points and exit points are they're your top snaring locations. They're some of the most high percentage snaring spots you can find. If you can find the primary entry and exit points set those spots on every pond you will eventually catch virtually every predator that's feeding and exploring that particular pond. This goes for bobcats, it goes for fox, and it goes for coyotes. This is a good setup. I set up on a trail Nailed this red, they come down off the lake, and you come right up the trail, and I nail them. Goes up that way. Okay, I'm out on this pond here. Now this is a beautiful pond. This is what I look like. It's way circling, you know, you got woods all the way around. And it's just a little backwater pond. but. The fox and coyote, it's unbelievable. I want to show you this trail. This trail is just perfect. Now you can see, I mean, look at the tracks. Just unbelievable. Of course, I can't let it go without hanging. Real nice cam lock. And you can see this trail. It's just gorgeous. Nothing but fox and coyote. And what they do is they just come right up down through and I, this is my fifth snare I laid in here so I'm really dumping the snares on this one and usually you can get them on the first night so this is this is what I look for a little backwater pond nothing but fox and coyote all right let's talk coyotes now these coyotes they've been coming on this pond and if you look it's just a backwater beaver pond and they've been just going nuts and what I like to do is get pinch points and what I'll do is I'll set up so they're crossing like a beaver dam and you can see right here here's a good pinch point and what I'll do is I dumped a cam lock right there and I kind of filled it in with grass around it and of course there's no trees or anything to stake to so I drive a steel stake into the dam and I use cam locks on this one and this will get her too. Then if you go over there, of course I have a second pinch point and there's a snare right there. And I'll just keep, every time I see a pinch point, I'll put snares in here. Okay, I got a real nice coyote. This is one of these sets where he was coming up through from pond after pond and that's what you want to do you set here and you set the pinch points and that's what I do is I set all these pinch points 
and Well, I want to thank you for being a part of this video. Uh, it's the last day, second to last day of January right now, and uh, I just pulled the last snare. We're, uh, we're starting to see the coyotes rubbing, and so uh, Rick had to work today, but uh, we're done for the season, and that's, so we're going to wrap this video up, and, and I really hope you enjoyed it, and uh, more importantly, I hope you got a few good nuggets of information out of it that will help you catch more fur and enjoy your trapping more. So I really want to thank you for that, uh, for being a part of it, for helping fund my trapping habit. And uh, I want to leave you with a couple of important points. First of all, every trap line is different. The scenery is a little different. The habitats are a little different. The animals react to the habitat a little bit differently. And, uh, you know, if you're trapping exactly where we are, then these exact methods work pretty well. Chances are your trap line is a little bit different and uh, you're going to get the most out of this video if you learn to adapt what we've showed you here to your own trap line. Uh, it's a good idea to just never stop learning. I've learned, you know, I've been trapping for over 40 years and I have never stopped learning and that should be obvious in this video. I mentioned earlier that uh, much of what's in, uh, in this video is stuff that I learned from uh, Rick and adapted from my own snaring um, methods in the past. So, um, I, I want to thank Rick uh, for being a, a big part of this and for what he's taught me. I also want to thank my son Dawson who edited this video. Uh, he's pretty good at what he does and I really do appreciate that. And once again, thank you and, and never stop learning. We'll see you down the snare line.